Shock is defined as a state of cellular and tissue hypoxia due to decreased oxygen delivery and or increased oxygen consumption or inadequate oxygen utilization. There are four broad categories of shock, distributive, hypovolemic, obstructive and cardiogenic. The wide range of etiologies can contribute to each of these categories and are manifested by the final outcome of shock. Distributive shock is characterized by peripheral vasodilatation and distributive shock may be due to septic shock, systemic inflammatory response syndrome SIRS, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock or endocrine shock. Now according to the third international consensus definitions for sepsis and septic shock, sepsis is defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction resulting from this regulated host response to infection. Septic shock is a subset of sepsis with severe circulatory, cellular and metabolic abnormalities resulting in tissue hypoperfusion manifested as hypotension which requires vasopressor therapy and elevated lactate levels more than 2 millimole per liter. The most common pathogens associated with sepsis and septic shock in the United States are gram-positive bacteria including streptococcal pneumonia and enterococcus. Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome SIRS, is a clinical syndrome of the vigorous inflammatory response caused by either infectious or non-infectious causes. Infectious causes include pathogens such as gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, fungi, viral infections such as the respiratory viruses or parasitic like malaria and rickettsial infections. Non-infectious causes of SIRS include but are not limited to pancreatitis, burns, fat embolism, air embolism and amniotic fluid embolism. Anaphylactic shock is a clinical syndrome of severe hypersensitivity reaction mediated by immunoglobulin E IgE resulting in cardiovascular collapse and respiratory distress due to bronchospasm. The immediate hypersensitivity reactions can occur within seconds to minutes after the presentation of the inciting antigen. Common allergens include drugs such as antibiotics and sage and food, insect stings and latex. Neurogenic shock can occur in the setting of trauma to the spinal cord or the brain. The underlying mechanism is the disruption of the autonomic pathway resulting in decreased vascular resistance and changes in vagal tone. Endocrine shock can also occur due to underlying endocrine etiology such as adrenal failure as in Addisonian crisis and mixed edema. Now coming to the hypovolemic shock, hypovolemic shock is characterized by decreased intravascular volume and increased systemic venous resistance which is compensatory mechanism to maintain pervasion in the early stages of shock. In the later stages of shock, due to progressive volume depletion, cardiac output also decreases and manifests as hypotension. Hypovolemic shock divides into two broad subtypes, hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. The common causes of hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock include GI bleed such as variceal bleed, portal hypertensive gastropathic bleed, peptic ulcer and diverticulosis. Vascular etiologies such as aortoenteric fistula, rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm, tumor eroding into a major blood vessel 
or spontaneous bleeding in the setting of anticoagulant use. Now, the common causes of non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock include GI losses in the setting of vomiting, diarrhea, NG suction, or drains. Renal losses due to medication-induced diuresis or endocrine disorders such as hypoaldosteronism. Skin losses as in burns, Stevenson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, heat stroke, pyrexia, and then third space loss in the setting of pancreatitis, cirrhosis, intestinal obstruction, and trauma. Now coming to the third category of shock, that is cardiogenic shock. Due to intracardiac causes, leading to decreased cardiac output and systemic hypoperfusion. Different subtypes of etiologies contributing to cardiogenic shock include cardiomyopathies, which include acute myocardial infarction affecting more than 40% of the left ventricle, acute myocardial infarction in the setting of multivessel coronary artery disease, or right ventricular myocardial infarction, or fulminant dilated cardiomyopathy or cardiac arrest due to a myocardial stunning and myocarditis. The second set of examples include arrhythmias, whether it is tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia. The third type of cardiogenic shock is mechanical, such as severe aortic insufficiency, severe mitral insufficiency, or rupture of papillary muscles or corda tendina trauma and rupture of ventricular free wall aneurysm. Now, the last category of shock is obstructive shock. This is mostly due to extracardiac causes leading to a decrease in the left ventricular cardiac output. It can be due to pulmonary vascular impair blood flow from the right heart to the left heart. Examples include hemodynamically significant pulmonary embolism or severe pulmonary hypertension or due to impaired feeling of right heart due to decreased venous return to the right heart due to extensive compression. Examples include tension pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade, restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis. Of the four broad categories of shock, distributive shock is the most common type of shock, followed by hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. Obstructive shock is relatively less common, and the most common type of distributive shock is septic shock and has a mortality rate between 40 to 50 percent. Now, coming to the pathophysiology of shock. Hypoxia at the cellular level causes a series of physiologic and biochemical changes resulting in acidosis and a decrease in regional blood flow, which further worsens the tissue hypoxia. In hypovolemic, obstructive and cardiogenic shock, there is a decrease in cardiac output and decreased oxygen transport. In distributive shock, there is a decreased peripheral vascular resistance and abnormal oxygen extraction. Generally, shock has the following three stages. Number one, pre-shock or compensated shock. As the name suggests, this stage is characterized by compensatory mechanisms to counter the decrease in tissue perfusion, including tachycardia, peripheral vasoconstriction, and changes in systemic blood pressure. Stage 2 is the shock stage. During this stage, most of the classic signs and symptoms of shock appear due to early organ dysfunction, resulting from the progression of the pre-shock stage as the compensatory mechanisms become insufficient. The third is end organ dysfunction. This is the final stage leading to irreversible organ dysfunction, multi-organ failure, and death.
Now, a focused history should be obtained from the patient, if possible, and or patient's relatives. Also, a review of the patient's outpatient medical records, including information regarding risk factors, medications, and 10 of baseline vital signs, including blood pressure, as well as hospital medical records, if any, and all this could give valuable clues regarding the patient's risk for shock and potential etiology. Clinical features and symptoms can vary according to the type and stage of shock. The most common clinical features and laboratory findings which are suggestive of shock include hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, obtundation or abnormal mental status, cold, clammy extremities, mortal skin, oliguria, metabolic acidosis, and hyperlactatemia. Also, features pertaining to the underlying cause of the shock can be present. Now, patients with septic shock may present with symptoms suggestive of the source of infections, such like skin in manifestations of primary infections such as erysipelas, cellulitis, necrotizing soft tissue infection, and cutaneous manifestations of infective endocarditis. Patients with anaphylactic shock can have hypotension, flushing, urticaria, tachypnea, hoarseness of voice, oral and facial edema, hives, wheeze, inspiratory strider, and history of exposure to common allergens such as medications or food item the patient is allergic to or insect stings. Now, tension pneumothorax should be suspected in a patient with undifferentiated shock who has tachypnea, unilateral pleuritic chest pain, absent or diminished breath sounds, tracheal deviation to the normal side, distended neck veins, and also has patient risk factors for tension pneumothorax such as recent trauma, mechanical ventilation, and underlying cystic lung disease. In a patient with undifferentiated shock, diagnostic clues to pericardial tamponade as the etiology include dyspnea, the back trite, that is elevated jugular venous pressure, muffled heart sounds, hypotension, pulsus paradoxicus, and known risk factors such as trauma, the recent history of pericardial effusion, and thoracic procedures. Cardiogenic shock should be considered as the etiology if the patient with undifferentiated shock had chest pain, suggestive of cardiac origin, narrow pulse pressure, elevated JVP or lung crackles, and significant arrhythmias on telemetry or EKG. Now, resuscitation should not delay while investigating the etiology of undifferentiated shock. Physicians should have a high clinical suspicion for the presence of shock and an attempt to stratify the severity of the shock should also take place to assess the need for emergent or early interventions. Evaluation of undifferentiated shock should begin with a thorough history and physical examination. Besides telemetry monitoring, a 12-lead EKG should be obtained. ECGs might show evidence of acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, or provide diagnostic clues suggestive of pericardial effusion or pulmonary embolism. Laboratory tests in a patient with undifferentiated shock should include a CBC and differential renal and liver function test, serum lactate level, cardiac biomarkers, the dimer level, coagulation profile, type and screen for a possible blood transfusion if concern for hemorrhagic shock is there, and then blood and urine cultures, blood gas analysis. Initial imaging studies recommended in patients with undifferentiated shock and hypotension include chest x-rays to look for the source of infections such as pneumonia, complications of shock such as ARDS, 
clinical findings supporting the diagnosis of pulmonary edema in cardiogenic shock, widened mediastinum in aortic dissection. CT scans can also assist in unmasking the etiology of shock in appropriate clinical scenario. Point of care ultrasonography or focus cardiac ultrasound is also a useful bedside diagnostic tool. The initial approach to management is the stabilization of airway and breathing with oxygen and oral mechanical ventilation when needed. Peripheral IV or intraosseous infusion access should be obtained. Central venous access may be required in the setting of a shock if there is difficulty securing peripheral venous access or the patient needs prolonged vasopressor therapy or large volume resuscitation. Immediate treatment with IV fluid should be initiated, followed by vasopressor therapy if needed to maintain tissue perfusion. Depending on the underlying etiology of shock, specific therapies might also be needed. In case of septic shock, Initial aggressive fluid resuscitation with IV isotonic crystalloids, 30 ml per kg body weight, within 3 hours, with additional fluid based on frequent reassessment, empiric antibiotic therapy within 1 hour. For patients with septic shock requiring vasopressors, target a mean arterial pressure of 65 mm of mercury. The first choice of a vasopressor is norepinephrine with the addition of vasopressin if refractory. Now, in case of anaphylactic shock, aggressive IV fluid resuscitation with 4 to 6 liter of IV crystalloids, stop the offending agent, intramuscular epinephrine or antihistamines, corticosteroids, nebulize albuterol. In case of adrenal crisis, judicious use of uh, fluids and then IV dexamethasin. In case of hypovolemic shock, obtain two large bore IVs or center line. Place the patient in the Trendelenburg position. Aggressive IV fluid resuscitation with two to four liter of isotonic crystalloids. PRBC transfusion if ongoing bleed. Appropriate medical or interventional strategies to treat the underlying etiology. Continue with isotonic crystalloids and use vasopressors if needed. Now, in obstructive shock, the judicious use of IV crystalloids is needed. If shock persists, early initiation of vasopressors, that is norepinephrine, and uh, vasopressin if refractory. If acute massive pulmonary embolism is suspected, thrombolysis should be done. Judicious use of IV fluids has a paradoxical worsening of hypotension because it may develop due to severe right ventricular dilatation and septal bowing compromising left ventricular filling. If tension pneumothorax is suspected, needle thoracotomy to be done, followed by tube thoracotomy, and if cardiac tamponade is suspected, pericardiosynthesis should cause significant improvement even with minimal fluid removal. In case of cardiogenic shock, if there is unstable tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia, initiate ACLS protocol and cardioversion. Judicious use of IV fluids in the absence of pulmonary edema. Consider inotropes. The vitamin is the most commonly used agent. Or intraortic balloon pump, IABP. If refractory shock and uh, vasopressor, that is norepinephrine with inotropes. If it is a STEMI, consider thrombolysis or coronary revascularization procedures and or IABP, that is intra-aortic balloon pump.